Good morning. Can everybody hear that? Am I on? Am I loud enough? I can be louder. The one thing in life I know that I can do is be louder. If I can get somebody to turn to Daniel chapter 1. We're going to read that here in just a second. Let's start with the question that I assume all of you are very prepared for this morning as we begin our, our class when we're talking about followership, and that is, I need someone to define osmosis. Fair? Not, not where you thought I, like, I, I prefaced it. Osmosis. Anybody? Science people? Fellow nerds. Osmosis. Just a general idea. You don't even have to do, use the scientific terms. Just any idea of what osmosis is. Yes. So it's the, it's the passage of water to a thing turning into a mineral. Yes. In order to do what? Which is a, a balance a balance between uh, the two sides of said permeable membrane. The permeable membrane, it's the only time you hear those two words put together like that, like only in osmosis. I say that because I want to use the idea of osmosis, not actual osmosis. And I want to say this right here. Holiness is not achieved or taken away through osmosis. Okay. If I say that, what does that mean to you? Holiness is not achieved or taken away through osmosis. Remember, it's not, we don't have a semi-permeable membrane here. Holiness is not achieved or taken away through osmosis. It doesn't rub off on you. Be, that's it, right. And then the other side of that is... You can't give it... It can't be taken. Like, being around unholiness doesn't make you more or less holy or righteous... Being around holiness doesn't make you more or less holy or righteous. That's the entire class for this morning. You guys have a good week. Uh, I say that because we're going to talk a little bit more about um, dealing with followership in authori- with a- authoritative or from dealing with authority uh, specifically when it goes against you, what you believe, okay? We're going to talk about that this morning. Uh, let's start with Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. If somebody wants to read that, you got to do it real loud because there's lots of people, and I've also been told that if from anybody that's watching at home, first of all, if you're watching at home, welcome, uh, or if you watch the video later in the week, that's great, but if you have to speak up because... I have the mic, and that's what's heard. So you have to be louder to where they can hear you. Chapter 1, 1 through 4. Who wants that? Okay. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there were no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, All right, so the quick, and, uh, the quick part of that is uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, sieges uh, Israel, takes back with him uh, this group of uh, people that are going to serve in the king's court. Specifically, we're going to skip ahead just because reading all nine chapters probably isn't, or ten chapters isn't necessary uh, for this this morning. There's four people that we've, we've referenced all throughout, and uh, if you're old enough, you've seen the flannel graphs of all of these people. Uh, the four are Daniel, 
uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So those are four uh, that are taken from Israel and brought into the king's court. Uh, something interesting, this is a complete side note and has nothing to do with that. this uh, or anything else, is that uh, when they came, the king uh, gave them new names. So Daniel actually changed his name. His Hebrew name is Daniel. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those are their names that they're given in Babylon, and they're actually assigned uh, the meanings. That they're assigned to different Babylonian gods. Uh, but Daniel says the same, and so we use Daniel, and then the other three changed, and we use the change names. I don't know why. It doesn't make any sense, and it doesn't matter. Uh, so he comes in. Uh, he brings them in. Uh, these, these, all the people that were brought in are, the, are seemed as the best of the best. They're also young. Uh, one of the places I read said that they were probably 14-ish, uh, around that age when they, were, when they were brought into captivity to serve in the king's court. Um, so, uh, The names that they're given, just, just so we are, their names before and after. Daniel uh, turns to, it's Belshazzar, I believe. Uh, Hananiah is Shadrach. Michelle is Meshach. And Azariah is Abednego. Uh, and so we're going we're gonna to actually take, uh, they've got three stories between the, the two groups uh, that we're going to talk about this morning. When we talk about what to do when we disagree with leadership. As a follower, as a group of followers, how do we stay in our lane of followership to earthly leaders and still follow God? How do we do that? And last week, one of the things that, that uh, Brandon specifically talked about was that our heavenly citizenship is the filter through which everything else comes. And like that, that's like that's kind of the, the big deal. Everything else gets filtered out. So the first story that we have starts in verse five, and I'm going to read some of this. Uh, so the king allotted them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank, and ordered that they be educated for three years, and at the end of which they were to enter into the king's personal service. Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander officials assigned them uh, new names, and that's what we just talked about. Verse 8 says, But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. Why would he not do that, by the way? What is, why, wouldn't he, why does he say he's not going to defile himself with the king's food? Yeah, like there's, there's a chance that it's either already been dedicated to a Babylonian god or just its preparation because uh, if you love reading uh, about food preparation, the, the first five books of the Bible cover very specific uh, food prep ordinances for uh, Israel. So there's a good chance that it's either already been dedicated to a god or it just wasn't prepared in the way that uh, Daniel was brought up, like uh, it wasn't kosher, basically. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't clean in his eyes. So he made the decision, I'm not going to eat any of this. Uh, middle of verse 8, it says, So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Verse 9, Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. The commander of the officials said to Daniel, I'm afraid of, the, uh, of uh, my lord, the king, who has allotted you your food and drink, uh, for uh, why should he see your face as looking gaunt in comparison with the youths who are your own age? Uh, then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. But Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, uh, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah, please put your servants to the test for 10 days. Let us be given some vegetables uh, to eat and water to drink, and then let our appearance be examined in the presence uh, in your presence and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food and deal with your servants according to what you see. I, here's the food you guys are going to eat. Okay, no, we're not going to eat that. We have a second plan. What do you think about this plan? Okay. The commander agrees to this, says, okay, we'll definitely do that. I'll inspect you guys at the end of 10 days. 
Uh, in verse 14, he says, so he listened to the matter, and he put them to the test for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, their appearance seemed better, and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. I think that's just my version where it says fatter. A lot of the other ones just say better, in better shape. Uh, but I, I like to think that they were eating vegetables and getting fat because that makes me feel better. <laughs> it's a side note. Uh, so the overseer continued to withhold their choice food and wine they were to drink and kept giving them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence of every kind of literature and expertise. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams, which obviously comes to play a big part later. We're going to have to open up in front of everybody a little bit this morning. Have you had an, a chance in your life that you can think of where it's been like this, where you've been given, when you've been not commanded to do something directly against God, because that's, that's, that's a pretty hard line, but where you see, I couldn't do this, like, I can do this, and it's fine, but I'm going to do this instead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow closer. Spoiler alert, I also had a hard time coming up with one. Um, and the more I thought about it, uh, the less I liked the reality of the answer because most likely the answer is I went with what was convenient instead of what was right. And then I didn't like have a matter of, it wasn't a matter of conscience or morality. I just was like, eh, it doesn't hurt anybody. And we're not taught, like, this isn't, this isn't in direct violation to God. They didn't say, you know, eat this food or you will die. But Daniel, in his wisdom, offered a second choice. What he didn't do was rally the troops and fight. He didn't uh, go and draw a line in the sand and say, this is what we're going to do and you can't do anything about that. He came with humility and still in submission to the king. And he presented a second offer. We're given opportunities like this a lot more often than I think that we give ourselves credit for. And I, what I want us to think about is When we have a choice between two things, are we always choosing the thing that honors God the most? Because I think a lot of times we see, you know, outside of this, we're not doing things specifically church-related, quote-unquote, uh, and so we say, well, this isn't a, a spiritual matter, and yes, it is. They're all spiritual matters. If, if the, the way that we see life comes filtered down through our heavenly citizenship, then every matter is a spiritual matter. Let me say that one more time. If the filter that you've put on your life to begin with is of your heavenly citizenship first, then every matter is a spiritual matter, meaning every decision is a spiritual decision. And if you say, I don't like that because that makes all my decisions harder, yeah, I, I'm, that's, that's what I came up with, and I didn't like it either. And I didn't want to do this part because it's sad and like, makes you think, well, that makes things more difficult. Now i got to like, go through my planning different. Yeah, yeah. If they're all spiritual decisions, then we have those op these opportunities that Daniel had to say, I see what you're asking for, and I don't want to go completely against that. However... This is what I'd like to do. And we stand up in our own way and we do what we see is right for God. Yes, sir. Sure. 
Sure. Well, so what we don't see is what happens if the guy comes back and goes, no, like, if you do this, I will die. Like, that's, the, that's like, I can't allow you to do this because the king instructed this. And I mean, like, obviously this is all speculative and, like, we don't actually have that. But so it, it worked in this situation. You're right. I'm not saying you're wrong. But, uh, but you're, the, the second part, the, the respectfulness, the, the submission that, that he showed to begin with. Hey, I know what you guys are asking. Can we do it this way instead? The guy says, no, yeah, I'll die. Okay, well, just, just try it. Let me, let me just try it. And if it doesn't work, you know, we'll go, we'll go from there. But it, it, it was going to work. So, and then it did. Fair? Good? I don't, yeah, you're right. It, it, it is, and I mean, like, we do draw those, but it's not, it's, it's not the aggressive. You're drawing a line with your foot instead of with a sword. Is that better? Does that make any sense? I just came up with that, and I think that sounds dumb. Uh, I thought it was great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. We move on to... Uh, there's, there's two stories that are, that are very similar to each other uh, in where it's not, it's, it's less of a, a matter of conscience and it's a matter of actual defiance to God. And we're going to quickly go through these two stories because, so we can, we can kind of talk about them. Um, uh, the first one is uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, getting tossed into uh, the the fiery furnace, um, which I like. I I have that image on the flannel graph burned into my head because then you put the fourth one up there, and there's like, who's that? You know, that was that was that situation. Uh, for someone that is that is well versed in this story, uh, would someone like to to give the the quick version of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Nebuchadnezzar comes up with this giant chocolate bunny and uh, no, he makes a giant golden statue and tells everybody to bow down to it. Right. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say no. Right. And he says, all right, I'm going to throw you in the furnace. That's right. They throw him in the furnace. The guards that open the furnace die because of the heat. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego go inside and they don't even smell like smoke and then there's a fourth person in there with them and they're like, well, what's this? <laughs> and the answer was, uh, and it says an angel. Yeah, it was, uh, there was there was a guardian, a person, a person, a fourth, a fourth individual, in there with them. Uh, one really interesting thing that I that I read in this, uh, the king that that um, when the king found out that they weren't going to bow down, he got very angry. Okay, this isn't going to happen. You're going to definitely do this. And I want to bring that up because there's a, a big contrast between that and King Darius's response to Daniel right before he throws him into the, to the lion's den. Um, so, he, so they say, bow down. They don't bow down. Uh, they get thrown into the fiery furnace. Nothing happens to him. They come back out. What's the, what's the king's reaction at that point? Hmm? Well, I mean, they, so they made it seven times hotter. Yeah. And so they come out. Everybody's, everybody's good. What, how does the king react to that? He was astonished. Praise the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's the one. You have a, you kind of have a, like a life check when you watch three guys get thrown into a fire, a fourth one shows up magically, and then those three guys walk out unscathed. If you see that, like, it's either the greatest magic trick of all time, or you watched a literal miracle, and you can't not be affected by that. I use the double negative on purpose. You can't not be affected by seeing 
such a miraculous thing when he was so bent on them dying. Get rid of these traitors. Okay. Yes. By the response, because it wasn't just like, hey, I don't feel like going to the fire. You know? <laughs> like they were like, no, we're not going. And if, if you know, our God will save us. And if he doesn't, we're still not going. That's it. That's another big piece of that. You're right. I'm, thank you for not letting me skip over that. When, when the king comes to them and says, I'm going to throw, or you have to bow down or you're going to die. And they're like, look, we're going to be protected. We're totally good. Everything's fine. However, if we're not and we die, we're still not bowing down. We're still not giving in. Like this, this is our very literal line in the sand. We are definitely not crossing this to get there no matter what. We, like, you can kill us. That's great. We're okay with that. We made peace with that. We think we're going to be fine, and if we're not, so be it. The harsh reality of that for us is we bow down faster. We can, we can make that rationalization super quick. And it's not necessarily... It's not necessarily in defiance of God, but like I said earlier, if everything comes through the filter of your heavenly citizenship and every decision is a spiritual decision, then I think that we put God in second or third or fourth place more often than we think about and obviously more often than we should. The second story is with uh, Daniel going into the lion's den. Um, it's the same kind of situation uh, where there's a law made. Specifically, uh, a few of the other rulers uh, come to the king, King Darius, and say, you know what we should do? Because they didn't like Daniel, and they wanted to get rid of Daniel, and they couldn't come up with any other way to do this, is say, everybody only prays to you. And if anybody prays to anybody else, specifically some of those Jewish gods, wink, wink, we've got to, we've, you know, then we're going to throw them into a lion's den, and they'll just be eaten and killed, and everything will be great. And King Darius is like, ah! I mean, that's a little harsh. Uh, probably, I don't know. And they finally talk him into it, and he signs the document, so it becomes law. Uh, and they even, they even say, like it even comes up in here, that they, they say that, you know, this is a law that you can't easily go back on. Like they bring that up to him. You can't just go back on this. So they, they know what they're doing. They wait for the right time. Daniel prays three times daily. Uh, out a window that points towards Jerusalem. Do whatever you want with that information. I thought that was interesting. Uh, they catch him. They bring him to the king. And they say, he was praying. And Daniel's like, yep. Um, what are you going to do? And Darius is like, okay, what can I do to get you out of this? So the first king is ready, angry, ready to throw them into the fire. King Darius, on the other hand, is like, Daniel, you you and your God are like, I, I know this connection that you have and I, I don't want to do this, but I can't go back on this law. They, they kind of cornered me into this and I can't just waffle back and forth like American politicians. I think that's in there. Um, I've got to stand firm on this. I know your God is going to take care of you. And he puts him in the lion's den and covers him up with a stone. And uh, they wait till the next day. And they open it up. And Darius says, yells down, are you okay? Which uh, I would be terrified to open that and then just like smell the blood and just like watch body parts like strewn about because that's probably not, he's probably not the first person to end up in that lion's den. But we all know the story. He turns out okay. Everything's fine. And King Darius says, no one can ever go against the God of Daniel again. I will ask the same question that I asked the first time. Have you had times where the authority or someone in charge, someone making rules or decisions has placed something specifically in your path to God. Yeah. 
what is your modern day Daniel story? Yes, sir. What's, what's striking about that story is that they can't find anything wrong with him, right? They find no dirt on Daniel, so they have to use what's good. Right. So they take what's good about Daniel's life and practice, and they weaponize it against him. That is. And I feel like that's what the powers that be and authorities do with the Christian faith a lot. They take the things that are good and weaponize Scripture tells us that that's what will happen. Right. That things that are good will be called bad, and things that are bad will be called good. I feel like that's a battle we fight every day. I hope everybody wrote that down. That's the weaponization of the Christian faith against Christians uh, is a very, very everyday battle. And a lot of times you want to be like, hey, that's not, that's not really how it is. You know, it's not like what you're saying isn't necessarily true, but there's so many examples in the world of when it was true that it's hard to argue that it's not with you. You bunch of hypocrites sitting out there thinking you're better than everybody else. I don't think I'm better than anybody else. I promise you that. But when I talk about trying to be holy and trying to be closer to God, it comes off that way. We have to be careful how we, how we approach people, how we talk to people. What else? I have 25 minutes allotted for this question, so you guys have to talk. Think of something in the culture in which we live where we're not persecuted and you know, if I was having this conversation in Zimbabwe, I, I don't think people would hesitate to give you examples. You know, I had a guy sitting talking with me in 2010 who was missing half of his arm because <coughs> they wanted his son to join their militia. And they took his son by force, and so he fought for him. So they took him off his bicycle and took the bicycle chain, and they whipped him with it until they took his arm off. You know, I'm like, I can't even fathom those kind of things, but they also are doing what's right, but they're also trying to work, you know, they're trying to be good citizens there, not draw a lot of attention to themselves. But there's right. A, so I, don't, I just say all that to say the very fact that many of us can't think of something just tells you what kind of environment we live, and in some way that's a blessing, but sometimes when we're not tested, or we don't have to make decisions. Um, or at least it seems like we don't, we kind of become complacent. Yes. I'll be controversial. Yes. <laughs> uh, so we just had this happen, actually, with COVID. Um, the city issued a mandate or whatever that if you were caught out, if someone reported you out and you were not performing an essential function, you could be fined seven hundred. Right. That was in Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. That was two years ago. Um, so not many people came out. We stopped worshiping. We stopped attending church. More or less because people were scared of getting sick or whatever. But uh, the fact remains, uh, in other countries and other states, churches were being raided. In fact, there was one, uh, I can't remember the exact state now, but the a ton of Law enforcement officers drove past a Sonic drive-in that's completely full. People in their cars went to a church where they were having um, church services broadcast on a big screen. Everyone's in their cars. Mm -hmm. No one was in person. And they were issuing them all like $1,500 tickets for being out. Passed the Sonic, went to church, and attacked those people. It does happen just under the guise of public health or for the greater good or whatever. Right. And we're, we're still at the tail end of that right now. Sure. 
uh, good job on the controversial part for sure. Uh, it is, it is, you're right. When we're, when we're told that we can't do something specifically having to do with the body of Christ, how do we respond to that? Yes, sir. No, uh, I posed that question on purpose that way in order to get that answer eventually. So, you, I mean, like, yes, you're right. And, Daryl, along with your point, uh, if you guys Google uh, modern-day Daniel examples, what it will give you is a list of scriptures that just talk about the stories of Daniel. And, and especially in America, where, like, it's like, oh, Christians are bad, but, like, nobody's going to stop you. From being a Christian. No one's going to beat you with a bike chain until your arm comes off here. That won't happen. But when everything is filtered through the lens of our heavenly citizenship, then all decisions are spiritual decisions. And whether it's having a food, our food choice or being asked specifically to, to not, or to bow down to another God, they're all decisions. And we have to weigh the costs, we have to figure out what is right, and then we have to live wholeheartedly with that. We're actually going to get out a couple minutes early because that's kind of the end of what I have. If anybody has any comments about that, uh, uh, there's some big things in there. Um, what Brandon brought up last week with the filter is, uh, I think, something that we don't give enough credence to in all of our life. So your homework this week is this. Apply that filter. Apply the filter of every decision is a spiritual decision. Because the sons and daughters of God, they are. It may or may not change much of what you do. It may change why you do some stuff, but it may not change much of what you do. We're still all, we've still got jobs. Uh, my job is just numbers. I believe, I believe they're, those are very spiritual numbers, uh, but from the other side of heaven, like it's, they're not, not good. It's just, that was a failed joke about them being from hell. So <laughs> apply that filter this week. Uh, take into account that everything that you're doing, big, little, how much time are you spending with your kids in prayer or reading? I'm not doing enough. Uh, how much time are you spending with your friends asking about their lives? Uh, Daryl talked about um, some of their best e-group moments are when someone comes in and says, hey, I'm dealing with this this week. Can we talk about this? And they drop everything else and deal with that. Are you dealing with those things with your brothers and sisters? Are you letting other people deal with your stuff with you? That's another big one. I'm like, it's very easy for me to be like, give me your burdens. And then it's a lot harder for me to be like, hey, here's my burden. Will you carry it with me? But we're all asking for that. If all the decisions are spiritual decisions, then how does that affect your week? That's all I've got. Thank you guys. Go get your kids. See you guys next week. <laughs>